thank you for joining. So a little bit about myself. I'm the head of partner engineering at Imply. I've been in Imply for more than two years now, but a majority of my experience pretty much um, is a combination of, uh, you know, cloud um, optimizations in GCP and Azure in AWS, uh, even data warehouse and OLTP and OLAP in general and uh, JVM performance tuning. So about 10 years of experience are pretty much focused on um, tuning applications to squeeze as much uh, performance as uh, I can get uh, from these different uh, applications. Um, so, you know, speed is one thing that I really uh, get excited about and the, uh, the trend in um, the big data space has been moving to a open source project, you know, called Druid, which we will dig deeper into it. Um, but I'd like to, um, you know, show you guys here a, a set of three different um, components of the overall presentation and starts with the real time uh, decisions. Uh, which uh, touches on a lot of the different upcoming use cases uh, that you might have heard of, and some of them are already running production for a couple of years. And Apache Druid as the tool to essentially empower those different uh, real-time applications. Um, and then we'll dig deeper into its uh, performance anatomy on why Druid is such a good fit. Uh, for real-time uh, platforms or real-time applications that would require past decisions. All right, so um, a lot of the organizations has been moving uh, to a data-driven culture, um, as you can see here at the bottom. Uh, and this has been going on for you know at least eight years and organizations are still <laughs> moving there because it takes a while for an organization to change the culture. And if they, don't want, if they want to be data-driven, it really starts from the top and then it you know, goes at the bottom. Um, and the majority of what uh, they're looking at at this point, since they have established you know, all of their um, data standards internally is making sense of that, right? And by making sense of that, um, the AI and machine learning workload has become so popular uh, that it uh, become a, became a standard for uh, really improving the business bottom line. Now, the other thing too here as part of the equation is the real-time analytics, which is very different from you know, AI and machine learning. Um, real-time analytics uh, is mainly driven by a lot of the use cases that we see today where data gets generated uh, really, really fast and on the fly and you have to analyze that data like immediately. So it's a little bit different. Um, and, all, and both of these um, approaches for um, analyzing the data um, eventually helps a lot of the analysts and business stakeholders to make decisions that are revenue generating. So, so this is the, the trend that we're seeing and the basic foundation really for organizations to be successful um, in their business. So we're gonna focus on the real-time analytics piece of things. Um, so one use case that you see here is the smart transportation. Um, you know, trucks in the old days, you really don't have sensors, right? But um, now um, they're putting a lot of sensors into it. Uh, not just the refrigeration system, but you know also the tires and um, rigging the, the truck to have a GPS information um, and then measuring how fast the truck is going. Um, humidity and temperature, freight monitoring and so on, right? So all of this information are actually generated in real time. And then um, that information then gets uh, sent to the back office so that the, all of this real-time information can be analyzed immediately. Um, so the value essentially that organizations can get from this kind of um, setup, especially uh, you know, like tracking companies or in a supply chain business 
is to uh, maximize uh, the usage um, of their assets, you know, on the road by routing them to the fastest route and also avoiding any kind of spoilage that um, the truck is uh, carrying on its payload um, that's got refrigeration system into it. And then for safety purposes as well, right? So now tire pressures can be measured as well. And then there could be trends that can be uh, either predicted or um, identified where, um, you know, trying to avoid any kind of like accident because you, you see all these trucks sometimes starts just blowing out. And so before they do, based on this data, you can alert the driver and say, hey, um, looks like you might need to change your tire uh, soon before it blows up uh, for safety reasons. So um, smart transportation is becoming a reality and then smart city as well. Um, Australia has done this and some other cities as well. And it, it is really putting the intelligence at a hyper local base within a city. Um, perfect example is uh, smart, you know, uh, smart buses where um, uh, these buses are pretty much um, electric in nature. And based on information around the city uh, for traffic information, then that bus can be, you know, rerouted on a path where there's uh, list traffic on it. And especially this uh, uh, bus is um, uh, driverless, right? Um, and another thing, uh, when a sports event happens um, where uh, near the arena, uh, you have this, um, you know, pedestrian signals, right? Um, and these pedestrian signals can be actually converted as a parking space. And so that signal uh, can be dynamic in terms of display information where before event happens uh, at the arena, um, that could be a uh, pedestrian signal. But then once sports event happens there, then they could change that into like a parking signal. Um, so a lot of information um, are, are gathered in real time. And the goal for the city itself is to uh, provide safety for the citizens and enable citizens to communicate with the government by, via this infrastructure in real time. And then optimizing really uh, any kind of resources that the, the city has. Um, Smart Homes is another. Um, Residio is a company uh, who is essentially a leader in the smart home intelligence space or smart home in general, um, where they provide sensors to you know, detect water leak or uh, carbon monoxide levels, um, smart switches and so on, right? So there's a lot of sensors that goes into the house now. And so uh, homeowners have the ability to download the app and look at all of these different readings that comes from all of these sensors for safety purposes. Um, and they can be alerted if the carbon monoxide uh, goes to a level where it's becoming more of a threat uh, to them at home. And so this kind of uh, real-time data is very useful for the homeowners. Um, another is the industrial 4.0 revolution. I used to work for Perkin Elmer Auto Electronics uh, where I was responsible for building circuit boards for space shuttle back in the day. And um, everything was uh, pretty much uh, manual at that point where uh, at anger, at every single step of the process in a production line, you have an operator uh, doing things, uh, assembling things and checking for um, parameters that would actually uh, make like a quality check uh, for that product that the operator had, you know, put together and pass it on to a different operator. These days it's fully you know, automated and there are a lot of sensors uh, that are rigged into the production line. And so uh, these sensors are then responsible for emitting all of the information. And this information can be then analyzed in a way where um, it can be trended to a yield. So yield is just a, uh, a foundation for measuring how effective the production line is in terms of producing good quality products. So if you have, you know, if you put in a hundred um, parts and you expect it to produce, um, you know, 10 parts or 10 products out of the production line, and then um, 
uh, five of uh, the products are pretty much the defective, then that's like 50% yield and they don't want that. And so uh, the ability to detect um, trends where the, the yield um, goes down or even before it goes down um, can be averted uh, by you know, having this information at the tip of the fingers uh, for plant managers to take a look at and start uh, necessary, you know, making changes necessary to prevent um, the production line producing more defective products. <clears throat> Another thing here is the, you know, from financial space, uh, anti-money laundering. And uh, there are organizations, banks is to be specific, using um, applications like Druid to uh, detect if there are some transactions that are anomalous in nature. And what banks will do is decrease uh, um, false uh, positives and also false negatives and be more accurate in terms of um, identifying what transactions are actually anomalous. Um, from a security space, uh, you have you know, your typical compliance and fraud as well. Um, and obviously, uh, security is, is such a, a big um, initiative for each organization. And, and that's because of uh, one, protecting the reputation, and then also um, either reducing fines um, or completely eliminating fines by complying to all of the standards that the uh, uh, public and private uh, organizations are putting in place for um, companies, especially in the financial space. So um, all of the events that are pretty much uh, coming into organizations are measured in real time, analyzed in real time to detect any kind of um, you know, fraud activity that are happening, um, including crime, uh, crime too, right? Uh, so we, talk about smart city earlier and, and one thing that smart city can do as well from a crime perspective is enable all of cameras that they have along the road and then based on given a video feed um, they can analyze that if a certain event uh, that would lead to a crime uh, might happen soon and this uh, uh, you know this digital marketing space has been around for a while but uh, it's uh, also a big driver for a lot of the real-time analytics there. Um, so you have your typical uh, advertising, um, social media, uh, live streaming, and so on. Uh, all of this different um, information uh, requires real-time analytics as well. And so uh, all of these different use cases are real-time in nature. And so we're seeing this trend of organizations start using Druid uh, as their next generation platform to enable them to uh, analyze data in real time. So let's go ahead and uh, drill down into what Druid is. <clears throat> so Druid is a um, you know, high performance analytics data store uh, event driven data. That's you know, a, whole, a whole lot of words in there, but if we break that down into four parts, um, uh, high performance really is uh, giving you a very query very low query uh, latency, uh, even in the millisecond range. So it's very doable to get double digit millisecond and up to you know a couple hundred millisecond. And that's like the sweet spot for Druid. And then high ingest rates where you can ingest um, data even you know millions per second if, uh, if you want to. Um, so it's analytics data store, which is actually columnar database. And you can, do your typical counting, ranking, group by and time trending. Um, and it's a data store, which means that you have a uh, cluster that stores copy of your data um, so that all of the processing are done locally and with shared nothing architecture. Um, Event-driven data, um, as we saw earlier from uh, the different use cases, that's the sweet spot uh, for Druid. You have your typical clickstream, net flows, data, digital marketing, um, server metrics for APM, and then IoT and user behavior as well. Um, key features, uh, you can ingest data from Kafka uh, or Kinesis. Um, there are other areas where you can also ingest in real time. 
You can also backload from Hadoop in S3 and pre-aggregate your data upon ingest, but you can also do aggregation on the fly if that is needed on your data. Um, it's very schema-like. You only have to deal with one table. Um, that's how um, Druid actually stores data. So you have a denormalized table, and that table could have you know, a couple of columns to multiple thousands, even up to 2,000 columns. Um, ad hoc queries, and then doing the exact and approximate algorithms, especially in the ad tech space, approximate algorithms are fairly useful. And that's because the data that's coming from the web for advertising purposes is very high cardinality data. And so it's really hard for um, analysts to do an exact um, function on very high cardinality data that would require a very low latency query on that data. And so approximate algorithms are there, uh, even giving you the ability to do between you know, two to 3% um, error rate, which is really pretty good because the standard in the statistics is 95% confidence level. So even if you have 5% error rate, um, the, the data or the information you're getting is still a pretty good. And then you can keep a lot of history of data, even years. Um, so these are the key features that um, uh, Kinesis can, or um, Imply or, I'm sorry, Druid um, can uh, give you. Um, the uh, the, really, the heart of Druid is based on the intersection of those three different products. Um, you have your time series databases, data warehouses, and then search systems. The uh, time series um, databases are great. They have their own purpose. Um, but typically, with the challenges there is that it's, it's really hard to scale them horizontally. And then uh, you can only look at a subset of the data. Uh, but Druid has borrowed how time series databases function um, for analyzing the data. You know, another piece to this are the data warehouses where um, a lot of the OLAP type processing also exists in Druid. Um, so we're borrowing um, a lot of the uh, typical um, way of accessing data you know, that you're typically used to from Teradata or Greenplum or even cloud data warehouses. Uh, like Snowflake and Google BigQuery. And then search systems, um, you know, they, uh, they're great for what they do, uh, but once you start doing a heavy anal you know, an analysis of your data from uh, uh, all of type, all of type analysing, uh, analysis, then um, your, you know, the, the system starts uh, really um, uh, have a hard time um, uh, doing the work of finishing the query really, really quick. Um, so uh, Druid borrows also some of these uh, capabilities that the search system has and package them into one, and then really enable organizations to query a large amount of data, even in the petabytes range. And so, um, so this is the trend that we're uh, seeing as well from organizations where um, the uh, the need to not only use um, all of type processing like your typical you know group by counting and ranking, uh, but you would want to also search on a particular dimension, and then add on top of that your query, and then doing some time functions as well on top of that. So that's a very typical um, way of accessing that we're seeing uh, from a lot of these new real time systems that are coming up. So let's dig in into the performance anatomy and just quickly checking here if there are any other questions. So let me know, Tinish, if you have, uh, if you see anything in here. Um, so really the heart of the performance of Druid lies in how it stores the data or creates the data. Um, so there's what we call segment and this is immutable and this represents the, the data that lives in Druid. It's time partition for fast reading. And then it's a bitmap index. So all of the strings that are in the records are actually indexed using a bitmap. And the advantage of using bitmap is that um, 
you can compress them really, really good, even reaching up to 10 to 15 times compression, but at the same time, operate it as they're compressed, yeah, operate it in, in bits as opposed to true value. So, um, so that really gives you the speed of uh, computation. And then you prune before you also uh, compute your data. So, um, so this indexes then becomes the, the engine to uh, prune quickly any records that shouldn't be read and processed uh, based on given filters that are provided in the query, which I will show you an example later on. Um, dictionary encoding is also another one where we avoid unnecessary string manipulation. And so you'll see uh, this encoding, you know, in numbers as opposed to uh, manipulating it in strings because string manipulation is very heavy. Um, and so dictionary encoding really helps us with the query speed as well. And obviously the segment is compressed. Uh, it will be written to this really, really fast. And then you can read at, as well, really, really fast. So this is the uh, basic building block of how Druid uh, performs really well from a query perspective. The optimal uh, segment size is uh, around 700 MB. And the way how um, this uh, size affects performance is uh, pretty immense. Um, so the way how Druid works is um, it spawns one thread per segment. And that thread will then scan that 700 MB of data. And the scanning could go from, you know, less than one millisecond to double digit millisecond. It's really, really fast. And so we wouldn't want to waste a cycle of reading a lot of small um, segment sizes because that would then reduce your computational bandwidth and then also um, choking the JVM. So this is the best size for each segment. Uh, for optimal uh, JVM utilization as well. So peeling back the onion more here, uh, this is you know how a segment looks like from a record perspective. So we have about five dimensions here, and um, we have a couple of uh, string dimensions and some numbers. Um, so all of the records uh, actually have timestamp in long. And then all of the strings, which are artists and city, are actually um, indexed uh, by default. And then you can see in here that there are three blocks of information that represents uh, a string. The data itself, um, which are pretty much encoded, and then the mapping of the encoded data with the dictionary, as you can see here, um, an example, which is uh, some of the artists that we see, Justin Bieber, and you have um, zero representation. So the first three records here are actually uh, Justin Bieber's. And then we have um, the index. So the index is pretty much uh, relative to the position of a record in the dictionary. So this arrangement is pretty much exactly how it's laid out here on the index uh, block. So the first the record is actually Justin's. Um, so you have your um, index uh, here and then your uh, filter information. Um, same thing with the city. Um, so as you can see here, uh, you, you have uh, three different cities. And then um, the price uh, is actually representative of the uh, total price uh, with the number of tickets sold uh, for a particular artist in a given city. So um, let's take a look, for example, here, a query. So we have um, a very simple query that pretty much uh, selects uh, the city and groups by city uh, based on the total uh, price uh, for a given concert in a given city by a specific artist, in this case, uh, Justin. And so what happens is uh, once that uh, uh, query runs, uh, what Druid does first is look at the work loss and then maps the, uh, the artist um, based on the given value. And so we would look at this column and then uh, goes to the very first record here in the index information and then grabs all of that. And um, the key right here that you see um, is actually representative of the uh, city as well, which is zero, one, and two. Um, and so uh, what query, what uh, Druid does in this query is uh, once it runs, um, 
we have the uh, information on the city and then also the prices uh, for those cities uh, based on you know the tickets that were sold and in this case we see um, you know uh, DC LA and uh, San Francisco um, there's uh, really no uh, value for DC and so we only have um, the prices for LA and San Francisco. And this result actually uh, lives uh, off heap. And what Juri does is it does what we call late, late materialization, uh, which means that um, it would only actually uh, need the real value of the data once it's done with the computation and send it back to the calling client just so they can see it in, in a text form. So in this case, it's still operating on the uh, dictionary encoding, uh, but once it's uh, completely done with all of the computation, um, it would swap the um, uh, dictionary encoding with the real value, and then don't do anything with this, it will actually drop that, and then send it over back to the calling client. Um, so, uh, so that's how um, the query actually executes. Uh, with this particular record and the, uh, uh, the other thing that I'd like to point out here is um, the data, uh, which is including uh, all of these uh, data dictionary and indexes are actually residing in memory along with this uh, price and, and counts as well. Um, dictionaries on heap, uh, but the data indexes are actually um, off heap. Um, so Druid memory maps that data uh, so that um, it can be accessed faster. And then adding on top of that, its ability to use dictionary encoding and indexes uh, makes it even better. So this is the architecture of Druid. And we have a couple of uh, different um, services here. Uh, as you can see here, master server, the coordinator in Apache Zookeeper are responsible for uh, monitoring the um, overall health of the cluster and also managing the, the segment. So coordinator is responsible for managing that segment. So it has to know where the segment lives um, across the different services here on the data server tier. Um, so the data server tier is where all of the segments are actually stored and generated. Um, so if we look at to the right side, you have streaming data and batch data. Um, this streaming data, for example, you know, if it's coming from uh, Apache Kafka, the index are responsible for receiving all of that data and then generating the, the segments and then publishing that segment over to the deep storage, which is your long-term storage. Um, and this are uh, typically, you know, your S3 or GCS or Azure Blob Storage or Azure Data Lake. Um, and once all of the segments are in here, then an announcement is made by um, the coordinator uh, passing in that information to the historicals and historicals will then uh, receive the segments or pull the segments from deep storage and make it available for querying. And so the broker is just a service that um, fronting all of the clients receiving all of this query and the broker has information um, on all of the segments and where they live across the data servers so that it knows where to actually uh, send over the, um, uh, the queries. So uh, Indexer also serves as a layer of uh, providing real-time information because some queries might say, hey, I want all of the data uh, that are from the last, you know, minute or even the last second. And so um, that data will come from the indexer and then any older data would come from the historical. So uh, deep storage uh, pretty much serves as a place where your data is protected. And then you, with the combination of your master server and deep storage, uh, even if your cluster is totally busted then you can recover from it, uh, as long as you have your deep storage and your master service, uh, then uh, in, in general, um, the uh, when I say master service here is the uh, 
the Metastore layer, which is uh, not shown. Um, so the Metastore is part of the master service. So as long as your Metastore and your div storage are actually uh, protected and live and running, then you can rebuild your cluster from scratch and point this cluster to the div storage and to the Metastore and you're back in business. So it's very resilient and it takes care of both uh, streaming and batch data and also allowing you to query data from you know the last second. Um, uh, I've seen organizations even querying it, but in milliseconds and then up to a week. So it's very, very flexible. Um, and from a ingest architecture perspective, um, we have uh, Overlord is really a, a service where it starts everything. So once a um, ingest task is submitted over, um, Overlord uh, hands it over to the indexer. Uh, indexer has what we call the peons uh, that are responsible for capturing data from a uh, queue. Uh, in this case, uh, it's an example is Kafka. It would pull all of that data and then creates the segment files. And then um, once those are created, then it would publish it to the deep storage. Um, and once that is uh, published, uh, a state is actually written to the metadata store that says these are the set of segments that were created and published to the deep storage. And then um, the, the coordinate, coordinator will then, uh, and it polls the metadata store. And as soon as it sees that there are new segments there, you'd make an announcement to the historicals and say, hey, historicals, um, uh, we have these segments that are available now for you to actually get, uh, so you can expose it uh, to be read um, and executed. Um, and so historicals will then go to the deep storage and grab all of those segments and then all of the segments will then be available in historicals and they would be uh, used uh, for querying purposes. Uh, query flow, um, this is a, uh, I know this is an eye chart, there's a lot of moving parts in here, um, but let's start at the bottom left here, which is the segment. And as we discussed earlier, um, you know, th that's uh, pretty much uh, the basic foundation of all performance uh, in Druid. Uh, but this segment is actually memory mapped from disk into uh, off heap RAM on the historical servers or data nodes is what we call it. Um, so the, uh, the segments are, are then loaded into off heap memory and available for reading. Uh, by the queries that are being submitted uh, by the broker, uh, which is also same as the query nodes here. Um, the thing to note here is that uh, the segments actually belong to a table, uh, which is a denormalized table. So these segments could be spread out into multiple historicals or data nodes um, that make up one table. So once data is in there, then um, that will be available for querying. And so when a query happens, um, query is submitted over to uh, the broker or query nodes. And then uh, within um, the broker or query node, uh, we have this concept of uh, uh, lanes. And, and lanes are essentially a, uh, a guard against other queries that are running within the same box um, so that no other query is actually using more resources than they are allotted to use. Um, and so that would really enforce the enforce or guarantee the SLA for the particular uh, query that was submitted. And so once query is submitted um, over to the broker or query nodes, then um, it would actually split that query based on where the segments are. So in this case, uh, very simplified, you know, we have two uh, historicals or data nodes, and then data nodes would then uh, receive the uh, uh, segment IDs, and then um, read those segments from memory, uh, and enforcing as well uh, query laning uh, to guarantee the SLA for that uh, particular query. And then uh, once it reads the segments and then prunes it, and then it's got what it's needed to essentially compute the data, 
then it would apply vectorization on the um, uh, query, which means that as opposed to reading one row at a time, it would take um, you know, 1,000 or 10,000, and that's configurable, uh, so that you can apply the same computation on a big block of rows as opposed to one, so, which also helps with performance. And then um, it would uh, use the buffer for all of the intermediate compute. And then once the intermediate uh, computations are done, it would cache the result uh, for that subqueries. And then um, once it's cached, it would use an off memory to store all of the uh, result sets and shoot it over back to the query node or broker nodes. Uh, and same thing for the other data nodes as well. And so once the query nodes uh, receive the um, uh, results from this uh, uh, different data nodes, then it would do what we call parallel merging. Um, so there are multiple threads that's responsible for uh, combining all of these records and then applying the aggregation. Um, and then once that's done, uh, then it would also cache the result and then the result stays uh, off heap and then sends it back to the calling client. Now, uh, the cluster that I'm showing you here um, is on tier one. Uh, we have this concept in Druid uh, called tiering where you can partition uh, a cluster into several parts where the first part could be for you know, high-speed query which you call tier one and then another tier for you know slower queries and another tier for maybe very, very cold queries where they don't even care when the query comes back. Um, so you have a single partition. Sorry, um, as long as listen, we have 10 minutes remaining. Thank you. Um, so, so partitioning or tiering is essentially a way to segment the cluster um, to make sure that um, you have uh, also guaranteed resources available to support SLAs across different queries. Um, there are also other computational strategies that you can use, uh, like approximate algorithm, uh, quantiles, data sketches, and so on are there for you to use. It's a shared nodding architecture. Um, it's distributed in nature. Uh, the biggest cluster that uh, I have seen so far is about 2,000 nodes and very high concurrency. Um, you can even do by the thousands of a concurrent query per second. And then total isolation between read and write. So you can actually write while also querying the data at the same time, which is very hard to do with legacy systems of today. 